Welcome to the Burn Your Mortgage Podcast, a Canadian real estate podcast that shows you how to pay off your mortgage sooner and live well while doing it. Now, here's your host, Sean Cooper. Welcome to the Burn Your Mortgage Podcast. I'm Sean Cooper, and it's great to be back for another episode. On today's show, I'll be talking to Barbara Captigen. Barbara had a 20-year career in communications and sales in the publishing and consumer goods industry. For the past 15 years, Barbara has been an independent consumer advocate for new home buyers, has advocated at all levels of the Ontario government for better consumer protection, and has written over 20 guest columns published in the Toronto Sun on this subject. Her first-hand experience as a new home buyer prompted her advocacy to fix what many have found to be a faulty system. Her advocacy work includes participating in ministry consultations, giving consumer feedback to Ontario legislative committees on new bills, helping consumers as a friend to navigate a complex process, and writing a blog. In my interview with Barbara, we discuss how she got involved with free construction condo and free homes, what are weasel clauses, and how can consumers protect themselves when buying pre-construction. Without further ado, here's my interview with Barbara. Hi, Barbara. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks, Sean. Wonderful to chat with you today. I was introduced to you by Ellen Rosevitt, and she mentioned that you're an advocate for reconstruction properties for both condos as well as freehold. So yeah, definitely interested to hear your story today and help educate consumers about things that they can do to protect themselves when buying those properties. Yes, thank you. Thanks for having me on the show and giving me this opportunity. I'm a consumer advocate for new home buyers, so that includes freehold homes and condos. And today we're going to talk about pre-construction new homes and some of the pluses and negatives and caveats that I can put out there for new home purchasers. Would you like me to tell your listeners why I came to this table and a little bit about my background? Yes, that would be great. Personal stories are always powerful. So if you wanted to start by discussing what inspired you to get involved in this space, then that would be great. Good. I was a new home buyer myself at one point, and I came to the conclusion that the processes which are set up to protect consumers in buying new homes are not sufficient. And I would like to try to impart to your listeners what they should look out for. What are some of the things that they need to know? Buying pre-construction, you'll never hear me say don't do it because there are certain advantages to, to doing that and there are certain disadvantages, which we'll discuss. And there's a whole area of advocacy where I'm involved in now as a volunteer on a totally volunteer basis in order to try to advocate with the government to make better protections for consumers in those areas. So I was, as I mentioned at one point myself, a buyer of a pre-construction unit. And it occurred to me that this contract that I'm being asked to sign looks very lopsided. There's everything, it was over 50 pages long. It had everything in there to protect the developer but nothing to protect me as the consumer. And then my attention by the lawyer was drawn to a mandatory document called the Tarion Addendum. Now it's called the Addendum. It's a mandatory document, very difficult to understand, 12 pages long. And I said, there's nothing in there, first of all, that I understand. And second of all, nothing in there that I see protecting me on the purchase side. And I wanted to make amendments to the contract. And the lawyer said to me, you know, the developer's not going to accept that because they'll just move on to the next purchaser waiting in line who's prepared to sign without making amendments to the contract. So speaking to lawyers is costing you every time you pick up the phone or you email them, it's either $400 an hour or $800 an hour and the clock is ticking. So I believe that what catapulted me into this area of consumer advocacy is, hey, this system is broken. 
this is lopsided, it's unfair, and who's responsible for this? It's our people who make the laws in Queen's Park. Consumer protection is a provincial responsibility, so let's go knock on the doors of the people who make the laws. Well, I've been doing that for 15 years. There are a lot of doors, they keep changing, and the progress has been at a glacial pace, I would say, for the consumer. So that's why I'm still active in this area. Well, thanks so much for sharing your story and maybe something in between a glacial pace and a breakneck pace somewhere in the middle would be nice. But I guess yeah. certainly I'm glad there's people out there like you advocating for the consumer because I find that the developers and other people are definitely well-funded, but the voice of the consumer definitely doesn't get through enough. And yes, no. I just wanted to be clear, some of the stuff that we're talking about today, yeah, like definitely... There are some takeaways for people across Canada, but when you mentioned stuff like carry on and other like the stuff specifically about the government, we're, we're speaking about it from an Ontario perspective, but definitely yes. if you're buying pre-construction across the country, whether you're in BC or Alberta or elsewhere, I definitely think this episode, there'll be some good takeaways from this episode. So be sure to, to still tune in, but just be aware when we mention some of these things, it may be just agencies and other things like that just apply just in Ontario. So just wanted to be clear with that. So yes, perfect. Thank you for sharing your story there, Barbara. And I just wanted to ask you about, we were discussing this offline here, but you mentioned that there are what is called weasel clauses in some of these contracts here that you sign when you're buying a pre-construction property. And yes, as a mortgage broker, I've seen these contracts that can be quite lengthy, like with a purchase with a standard purchase agreement for a resale property. I mean, yeah, there are a few pages. They can go on for like five pages or more, but these builder purchase agreements can go on for like dozens of pages or a hundred pages or so, so that they can definitely be a bit intimidating there. So yeah, I would imagine in there are, and and buried in, in the fine print there are what are called weasel clauses. So yes, what are these weasel clauses you're referring to? And where can people find them in the contracts and what do they need to be aware of when signing a contract? Well, you're quite right. These pre-construction sales contracts are written by the developers and their lawyers. I have two of them in front of me here from major developers. They're over 40 pages long and the mandatory government addendum is 12 pages long. So that's a lot of material to even try to understand when you're going into the pre-construction home purchase. But what are weasel clauses which may be embedded in there? One of them is, and I object to these, and I've been advocating that these should not be in the pre-construction home contract. For example, there is a clause in some of these contracts, not all, saying that the purchaser cannot start or join a class action lawsuit. Now, let's say that you go into a development and there are a number of purchasers, yourself included, who are dissatisfied with how things are going. This clause precludes you from what would otherwise be your right. And that is to, if you have enough money, take some of the issues of dispute to a court or to a class action. I don't think that should be in these contracts. Another weasel clause, which I think should be outlawed by the regulator, is a clause saying that if a dispute arises between the developer and the purchaser, that the purchaser may not speak out about that dispute. I think that also is like a gag order. That should not be in any contract. You can't contract somebody out of rights they have under other laws in the province. You can't contract somebody out of the right to speak free speech and you can't contract or you shouldn't contract somebody out of their right to commence a class action if they so wish. So those are two examples of weasel clauses. And another clause which has caused a lot of problems to some purchasers I've spoken to is in the Terion addendum, the 12-page complex document I was just mentioning. In there, there are rules and regulations which are set by government, so carry on, and now it's HCRA, who are their agencies, setting out the reasons under which developers can cancel or delay projects. And one of those 
is a statement saying, well, if the hard services to the site are not completed at a certain date, then the developer can cancel the contract. Now, there's a lot of weaseling around that you can do in that if you want to cancel the contract, let's say, and then potentially sell the units to somebody else at a higher price, developers can sometimes say, well, you know, the hard services like the sewers to the site were not completed on time, so therefore I'm canceling. I know cases in which that has been used. And then some of the developers have a few weeks later, all of a sudden started to build again and resold the units to other purchasers at higher prices and getting them to sign non-disclosure agreements about that resale. Now that's supposed to be forbidden, but the purchasers I know who've made a complaint about that to the regulatory agency have been told, oh no, that's allowed because that addendum says, yeah, the builder can cancel because of that. Was it in good faith? Was the builder acting with honesty and integrity? The regulator has said, yeah, we're going to give this a pass. We're going to let this go. And to me, there are too many loopholes and weasel room in there for the language is obscure and vague. And it can be manipulated to the advantage of, I suppose, whoever has the best lawyer or whoever can afford to put forward to assert their rights. And normally, individual consumers don't have the money for these lengthy, complex legal battles. And they often give up and just say, OK, I give up and I have to move on. And sadly, that's what's happened in some cases. Not all cases, not all developers are using that, but you don't want to end up the victim of tactics like that. And that's one of the things that I'm still advocating with the government, that the regulators should take a stronger stance on that and simply outlaw that kind of game playing with contract. And, you know, again, builders write these contracts with their lawyers. They can delay the delivery and timing of the construction. I think they have the right at least three times to do that. And they can change the layout somewhat. Um, That's often written into the contract. And now, this is shocking. I'm against it. I'm advocating against it. But developers can even escalate the price of the unit that's been sold. And they can come back to their purchasers and say, whoops, you know what? The price of labor and materials has gone up. And therefore, I can't afford to build that house anymore at, or that townhouse, let's say, for a price of $700,000. It's now going to have to be $900,000. And so here are the invoices that show that I'm incurring those costs. So you have to pay an additional $200,000. I'm against that. I think that a contract sets out the price that both parties agree on. And once that contract has been signed, well, you can't come back to your purchaser and say, whoops, I didn't forecast properly and the house is going to cost more. Any person manufacturing a product knows that they have to take into account that prices are going to go up. Prices of material and labor go up. I don't think they go down. Or I'm not ever familiar with a situation where they go down. So therefore, this can't come as a surprise. But the Home Construction Regulatory Authority, who is responsible for regulating this kind of builder conduct, has said that this is okay. Developers can do this if they act with integrity and honesty, and if they show the purchaser where the increases have occurred. But I think Would a developer then listen to a consumer or the purchaser who came to them and said, look, I lost my job. Look, I have a health issue. I can't pay $700,000 for this townhouse. Would you be willing to accept four hundred dollars or five? dollars No, of course not. I mean, it should go both ways. If the developer can do that, it should go both ways. But based on what you're telling me, it sounds kind of one-sided. Well, you're right. There's a concept, I think, in law and in contracts that is called reciprocity. Whatever is fair for one side has to be 
balanced and fair for the other side. Otherwise, the contract is out of balance. But as we mentioned from the outset, these pre-construction home contracts are written by developers and their lawyers. The consumer is not involved in this. And regardless of what the Home Construction Regulatory Authority and Terion will tell you, the addendum is not a consumer protection document. At least if it was intended that way, it's not protecting consumers. And that's a big area of my advocacy. I think that needs to be simplified and it needs to be balanced to make sure that home buyers are not being disadvantaged. I mean, developers can already change the price, the layout, and the timing of the building of the new home. So where are the rights for the consumer that are balanced there? Well, I think you can look a long time before you find any. And these contracts are out of balance. Nevertheless, I'm not saying don't buy pre-construction because there are significant advantages to consumers for looking at the pre-construction option. And those could be, I mean, I've heard many consumers tell me, well, I want to buy a home I can afford. And here's the price that's being offered for that home. I don't have competitive bids coming in and hiking up the price. This is the price, 800000 for a townhouse. It's located next to transit, which I wanted. It's located close to my work and my family. And I don't have my multiple bidders coming in on it. So I can know from the beginning that I can afford this house and that this is within my budget. In addition to the location and perhaps even the amenities, somebody may need two bedrooms instead of three instead of two, whatever. But sometimes people in a very tight market, which we're in now, where housing options are limited and scarce, many buyers could look at pre-construction as a very viable option for them. I guess what you're saying is like if you do decide to buy pre-construction, make sure you do your homework when doing that. Like if I was buying pre-construction myself, I would definitely do my homework and make sure that, I mean, this isn't a guarantee, but make sure that I'm buying from a reputable builder and developer who has history of developing on time and doesn't have a history of, of having this happen. I mean, I would definitely Google their name and see if they're in the media for complaints and stuff like that. I mean, it's not foolproof, but I definitely think that's a a good a step I would try to avoid developers that are always mentioned in the media stories for for maybe not uh, treating their clients the best. Well, that's true, Sean, and people should do as much research as they can. But even top developers have some tricks up their sleeves. You know, some of the consumers I've had come to me for help are have bought from reputable builders. And I'm not saying all developers are doing this. I'm saying the loopholes are there and these people are smart. And if the government who's responsible for protecting consumers is not going to step in, then we can't expect developers to self-regulate. I mean, that's just the reality of it. They have the power to write these contracts. They see where all of the sort of wiggle room is and they're going to use it. That's probably just business, isn't it? I mean, it's sad that consumers are being put in this situation, but the government needs to fix the loopholes which are in these contracts and protect buyers. And that's not a question of you or I doing our research. By the way, the key research tool which these government agencies keep telling us to look at is something called the Ontario Builder Directory. That is administered by this agency, HCRA, Home Construction Regulatory Authority, and Terion. And it's supposed to show you builder records, but it is not accurate. It's You can use it as a telephone book to sort of see who owns this company, when did they start building. You'll get a kind of top-line review of that builder's, what the builder has built, and if they've had any home warranty issues with Terry on, but it's very, very, very minimal. I would not use that as your criteria to look at which builder to buy from. But the tricks of the trade can be used by the good builders, the reputable ones, and 
the somewhat marginal ones, because this has to do with Ontario law. In my opinion, it's our lawmakers who are responsible for partly amending the laws, fixing the loopholes, getting rid of these weasel clauses, and stepping up to the plate to protect new home buyers. We keep hearing this government say, let's build more homes faster. But you've also got to sell them to people like you and me. And where is the political will to protect buyers? I don't see a lot of it. I see a lot of talk, a lot of window dressing. And I see the government, not only this one, but the previous one, dropping the ball on consumer protection when there's some very obvious things they could do today. For example, they could say that buyers of freehold homes, for example, a townhouse pre-construction, could have a 10-day cooling off period to look at the contract. Believe it or not, freehold home buyers don't even have that protection. That protection exists for condo buyers and timeshare buyers, but not for freehold home buyers. For example, somebody buying a pre-construction townhome or a single family home. Why that is still allowed to go on is baffling to me. Another area that the government could act on today is that they could say that all of the deposits for freehold homes have to be held in trust by a lawyer. That is not mandatory for the buyers of freehold homes. It is mandatory for the buyers of condos because of the Condo Act and because of certain protections that were brought in for condo purchasers. But freehold home buyers have been left in the cold on these two major gaps in consumer protection. And that's not the fault of lawyers. It may not even be the fault of developers, to be honest with you. It's the fault of those people at Queen's Park who make our laws. Well, I mean, I'm glad there are good people like yourself out there to advocate in terms of the voiceless, so to speak, because, I mean, these are definitely important issues. And, I mean, hopefully someone from the government is listening to this podcast here and tells their people to look into this stuff here. But I'm sure you're getting this through the right uh, channels and all that yeah. there. But I mean, you know, I'm sure most people don't learn about this stuff until they run into an issue. Until it's a, too late. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. So yeah, thank you for sharing all of that with me. We're just getting a bit close to the time here. So I'm just curious if there's one or two key takeaways you could just summarize in a minute or, or two here, just with if somebody like, we're not saying you shouldn't buy pre-construction, but yeah, for anyone buying pre-construction, what would you say are one or two key takeaways, if you could just summarize in a minute or, or two here of, of what people could do to better protect themselves? Well, you know, Sean, if I knew that, <laughs> I would certainly be on to it all the time, writing government, participating in consultations, doing everything I possibly can. The only thing you can do, I think, is just consider whether the risk outweighs the reward in terms of your particular situation. Look at the advantages that are going to come to you in buying pre-construction. Look at the record of the builder, although that you won't find probably much information. And see if these disadvantages, which I've outlined here, outweigh for you in your personal situation the advantages. I mean, it's like any other investment you would discuss with people. You know, there are risks involved in this. I think the government could easily handle those risks and should do that to try to make sure the risks are lower for purchasers. But that's a long-term goal. And I think that purchasers have to say, you know, I'm prepared to take on that risk profile because the advantages that I hope to get by buying that property in terms of location, amenities, price, et cetera, are to my advantage. But I would say don't let the developer railroad you into a price escalation after you have purchased, because that's supposed to be not done, except under exceptional circumstances. So be aware of that and be aware of these two agencies, Terion and Home Construction Regulatory Authority, HCRA, 
who are supposed to be advocating for you as a consumer. And I think we should make them do their jobs. Great. Well, thanks so much for being on the podcast, Barbara. It was great having you on and educating us about the pre-construction home space. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Burn Your Mortgage podcast. Besides being a podcast host, I'm also an independent mortgage broker. If you or anyone you know, family, friends, coworkers, or neighbors could ever use any unbiased mortgage advice or a second opinion, feel free to reach out. Email me at Sean, that's S E A N, at burnyourmortgage.ca or call or text me at 647 867 3711 for a free mortgage consultation. Also, be sure to head on over to www.burnyourmortgage.ca and sign up for my free weekly newsletter. As a small token of my appreciation, you'll be able to download my ultimate mortgage checklist on choosing the perfect mortgage. I look forward to hearing from you and helping you with all your mortgage needs. Once again, thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Burn Your Mortgage Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes and leave a rating. Until next time, happy mortgage burning.